Good morning, VCC family and friends. I'm so excited to be with you this morning and to share this uh, signpost that we started last week, uh, death to self and circumcision with you. Now, I know that when I mention the word circumcision, I probably lose 80% of the population right away. First of all, uh, all the female listeners are, are probably thinking, well, what on earth does that have to do with me? And then we have a whole bunch of other people that look negatively towards the, the practice of circumcision. But this morning, I want to show us, hopefully, a, a beautiful picture of what it symbolizes and what it represents now, if you would like to study the origins of the practice, you can go to Genesis 17 and read about Abraham and, and the covenant that God made with him and how uh, the command to circumcise himself and his son was a, was a reminder. It was simply an indication of what God was doing uh, in this covenant. And so the, the external circumcision was to be a reminder of this covenant. And so what is the covenant? And we're going to see that a true circumcision is all about this covenant and not an external uh, physical practice. If you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along this morning, I would invite you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're just going to read verses 5 and 6 together. Like usual, I'll be reading the text, so if you just want to listen, that's fine. But if you want to follow along and, uh, and read with me, well then I'll give you just a moment here to turn to that. Deuteronomy 30 verses 5 and 6. And this is what it says. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Did you catch that? The promise was to everyone, male and female, that the Lord would bring them first to the land, first to the place of freedom, to complete the process of liberation that he had begun with them in Egypt. That was his plan. He would bring them to this beautiful place. He would set them up. They'd have uh, borders, villages, towns that were their own. They'd, they have had, they'd have gardens to, to plant their vegetables and their grains. They'd get married. They'd, have, they'd, they'd do life. And that was God's plan. That was part of the freedom of God. And he would multiply them. God would multiply them in this land and cause them to become a people and nation. And in that process, he would circumcise their hearts. And what does that mean? The, the passage tells us specifically the purpose of the circumcision of their heart would be to allow them to love him with all of their heart and all of, all of their mind. And as we discussed recently, these, these are two, uh, one of the two greatest commandments that all the law could be summed up in this, that this was what God was after. And so I think this is beautiful that circumcision the true circumcision of heart produces someone who loves God with all of their heart. And so we're just going to look at this uh, this morning and, and share some ideas about this together. There are so many of us who call ourselves Christians, who accept weakness, who accept struggle, who accept failing. Now, let me explain that. When I say accept... I'm not trying to say that we won't struggle. I'm not trying to say that we won't fail, that we won't have areas that are, are difficult to be free of. But what I mean by accept is that we live with it. We almost start to believe that it's just always going to be there, that it's just going to be part of who we are. We just say, well, I'm, I'm human. Uh, I'm fleshly. I'm going to sin. I'm a sinner. And yes, <laughs> that's true. But are we supposed to accept these struggles? Are we supposed to live with these struggles? When we talk about being on the road to freedom, does our freedom entail these kind of struggles? And I believe this morning that it doesn't. It shouldn't. And it's not God's plan. And so if you allow me a couple of minutes, I'd like to show this to us uh, using Scripture. And so if you have uh, a Bible, of course you have a Bible. We've already been reading the Bible. 
Uh, turn to Galatians 5 with me, please. This, I would like you to see. This, uh, I would like you to read for yourselves. Galatians 5, verses 13 to 17. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge your flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law can be summed up in a single commandment, namely, you must love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second greatest commandment. Interesting. However, if you continually bite and devour one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh has desires that are opposed to the Spirit, and the Spirit has, has desires that are opposed to the flesh. For these are in opposition to each other, so that you cannot do what you want. We are called to freedom, and we are not. Uh, we are told. We are warned to not use that freedom to indulge the flesh. And so, when we indulge the flesh, we're giving room for the flesh. We're listening to the flesh. We're allowing the flesh to determine uh, our attitudes, our our actions, our beliefs, and even our feelings about ourselves. And I would like to challenge us to stop uh, accepting the flesh as if it's always going to be an issue. Because I read here that if I walk by the Spirit, I will and not indulge the desires of the flesh. If I live by the Spirit, I will put to death the works of the flesh. That's the promise of the Bible. And so this signpost, and remember a signpost is something that we can use to evaluate our progress. It's something we can use to determine how far along on the journey we are. This signpost is, is, is essential. I mean, they all are, but this one this one really is an all or nothing. This one really is about us being uh, on the right side of the road, walking towards our freedom. And at the end of this passage, we saw that if uh, we're in the flesh, we are opposed to the Spirit of God. The flesh is in opposition. When I watch a hockey game or a football game, uh, the one team does not help the other. They're not working in tandem. They're not working together to produce a result. It's one team that's trying to stop the other. It's one team that is in opposition to the other. It is opposing the progress of the other. And so if we want to live by the Spirit, if we want to have progress on our road to freedom, then we uh, cannot live in the flesh. We cannot indulge our flesh. We just can't. We're, we're warned uh, not to do this. And Romans 8 gives us a, an even more ominous warning. Romans 8 verse 13 says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. Right about now, you're probably saying, Hey, didn't you start off the video by saying this was going to be good? Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. Just stay with me. But, you know, we just need to be shocked a little bit out of this complacency where we have one foot in and one foot out. We just need to be shocked a little to get rid of this apathy where we just accept and, and, and we think that we're just always going to be this way. I heard somebody recently refer to it as a Jekyll and Hyde experience. And, and we need to stop living this way. We have to really um, not put our money where our mouth is, but put our heart where our faith is and get in line with this. So let's just keep reading Romans 8, uh, verse, uh, continuing on from verse 13. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery, leading again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, then heirs, namely heirs of God and also fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so we may also be glorified with him. Putting to death the deeds of the flesh 
is difficult. It is suffering because it's going against the prime instinct that we have. Those things that we seek after, those things that we crave. And I'm not just talking about drugs, sex, and rock and roll. These can be things like, like uh, overactive justice. This can be uh, unforgiveness because we just can't accept the wrong that somebody else, someone else has done. These are things that are very deeply ingrained in us, in our flesh. And so it can be very, very difficult, perhaps even seemingly impossible. But we're told that if we'll suffer through this, if we'll suffer through this circumcision, if we'll suffer through this death uh, of the flesh, then we will receive the Spirit of God crying out, Abba, Father. These aren't just niceties. This is like my, my response, my, my instinctual response when I'm faced with the crushing wave of my flesh will be, Father, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father, an intimate uh, uh, admittance of relationship and dependency. Father, come and rescue me. And when that spirit comes in, I, I realize that uh, I'm, I'm adopted. I'm a son. And if I'm a son or a daughter of God, then I'm an heir. And come on, being an heir, that's great. If you have a rich um, grandparent or a rich dad or a rich uncle, being an heir, receiving of their riches, that's the promise. And, and so we are an heir we have this promise of receiving the things that pertain to life. Now, some people get uncomfortable when we talk about putting the deeds of the flesh to death. They, they start to get worried that we're going to preach a salvation by works, that somehow we can earn our salvation, that somehow we have to do something to receive our salvation. Um, that's only half true. Because even Jesus himself, if you want the reference to look it up, it's Matthew uh, 16, verses 24 to 25. He, he said, If anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If we want to follow Christ on this road to freedom, if we want to be a disciple, then we do have to do something. And this is not salvation by works. This is just the response to grace. This is just the commandment to love God with all of our heart and love our neighbor as ourself. And so we take up our cross. We take up that, that symbol of death. We take up the place where the flesh is nailed forever, never to be taken down again, and we await for our resurrection. Now, that was a lot of uh, symbolic uh, speech right there, so let's break that down. It means that whatever I struggle with, I put it to death. I walk in the Spirit. I don't give it room in my life. I don't give it mental time. I don't give it bodily time. I don't let it direct me or uh, overwhelm me. I can be tempted by it. I can hear whispers of it, but I look at it and I say, no, I'm not living that way anymore. And the promise is, if I do this, both Paul and Jesus say, if I do this, I will live. If I put to death the self, if I put to death the flesh, then I'll live, then I'll be free. I can't say I'm free. If I haven't gone through this signpost, I can't. Jesus said it. Paul said it. James says it. Peter says it. Moses says it. The Spirit of God says it. We can't indulge the flesh while walking in the Spirit. It just, it just keeps us cycling. It just keeps us stuck. And maybe this is where some of us are at today, right now. But here's the, the real good news of it all. This is the promise of what circumcision does for us. And I'm not talking about the fleshly circumcision. I'm talking about that circumcision of heart that we saw in Deuteronomy and we'll see here to end today in Colossians. And so once again, a lot of scriptures today, but uh, this is good stuff. And so I want you to read this and see this and go back to it this week and, and, and just uh, dwell on these things in, in our minds. And, and I just trust that 
uh, we'll all walk through this signpost uh, together into full freedom. Colossians 2, verses 11 to 15. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. When Peter writes about Paul's writings, he said some of the things he writes are hard to wrap our minds around. And I, I would imagine this passage probably falls into that category. There's a lot here and, and I don't uh, intend to explain it all. And and I don't even profess that I'll be able to explain it all, but I just want to focus on that first part. We are circumcised with his circumcision. We are circumcised in our heart with the circumcision that he does. I've been saying to a few of my friends recently that the, the areas of freedom in my life that have been miraculous, I, I wish I could write a how-to book I wish I could share how I was set free from certain things that bound me for decades. And, and I, I said to my friends, I said, I find it so frustrating because I don't even know how. I mean, that's not totally true. I do know how, but I don't know how it was done. It was done when I came to Jesus in a very dark time and I called out to him and I said, all right, Lord, I'll do it your way. I'll follow you. And, and when I did that, like really honestly did it in the depth of my heart, then all of a sudden I felt this circumcising experience. I felt the areas of my heart that I thought were, were, were unaccessible, that, that ideas would never change, the attitudes that would never change, that when I went through that process, when I went under the knife, when I suffered the death, of these things, then I receive this miraculous circumcision. And I'm sure many of us can tell uh, similar stories. And I just wanna say as a personal testimony that this is possible. We do not have to suffer our whole life with these things that have us in bondage. It's just, it's just not part of God's plan. It's not his recipe for freedom for us to stay in bondage. It's just, it's just ludicrous, isn't it? And so it was for freedom that Christ Jesus has set us free. And then the, the last thing I wanna just take out of this Colossians verse is that he, he, he took it out of the way. Don't you love that phrase? He just took them out of the way. The things that used to be there, he just, he just takes them out of the way and he disarms them the things that used to hold us, the things that used to be so strong. And, and I'm, not, I'm not dumb here. I know that some of us right now while listening to this are still being swayed. We're still being held in bondage by things. We still feel like they have authority over us. But here I'm told that if I'll go through this signpost with him, if I'll be willing to lose my life for his sake, that then I'll have him just put these things out of the way. He'll disarm them. They'll lose their power. They'll lose their hold. Would you like that this morning? Would you like to have that experience? Would you like to have those things of the flesh fade away, just disappear and be moved out of the way? then I would invite you this morning to pray a prayer. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna pray one for you this morning. I'm not gonna ask you to repeat a prayer because this is a very personal experience. This is a very uh, authentic 
uh, thing that Jesus wants to do in our lives. And so it really does demand that sort of uh, personal experience or encounter with Jesus, like Nicodemus at night, or like Zacchaeus in his house, or like Mary at, at, the, at, at the table. We need to have this experience of laying down our lives and repenting, changing our mind, changing our attitude towards the things that we've just allowed to be there for too long, so long that they almost feel like they're part of us. It's time to be that new creation. And I end with this beautiful verse that's just all encompassing of what we're talking about. It's in Galatians 6 verse 15. And it says, for neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that matters is a new creation. And that circumcision Paul's talking about here is the physical circumcision. He's saying doing religious rites, doing rituals as extreme as cutting off a piece of your body doesn't matter in the long term. All that matters is that we become this new creation, that we become the new man, that we put off the old man or woman with all the deeds of the flesh and we become this son and daughter of God that is called to live a life of freedom. Amen. Pray that uh, this word, this message would give you hope and would give you encouragement and that after you turn this off that you would take time to reflect. And if you can't do that right now, then later on tonight or later on this week, get, get alone with God and pray about these things because it's, it's, it's all or nothing. We just have to stop being in opposition to God on this and get on his side on the road of freedom. Amen. God bless.